glad to see you guys and um, I'm going to ask Kathy to uh, come up and open us up with a prayer. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Let's pray. Lord, there's just something about standing before you and before others that I think of it as an opportunity, an opportunity to call on your name, Jesus, to know that you are saying you want to hear from us and what a blessing that is. So we bring you this service time this morning. We bring you ourselves and we are so grateful that we don't have to conjure God this morning. Mm -hmm. We just can be present in your presence. We can just hear from you and let you speak to us. So please speak to us, Lord. Please lead us in all the ways that you have for us today. And I pray that we would be pleasing to you just because we are yours today. I pray that you would forgive our sins and set us right with you. I pray for all the things that we are battling this morning, Lord. And I pray for your mighty right arm to just bring the victory in every single way that you have, Lord. But I also pray that just deep inside, you would help us to just breathe you in, mm -hmm. breathe out the other stuff, breathe you in, breathe out the other stuff in a way that's hearing who you are, hearing what you are saying to us today. I pray that your word would go deep inside and change us and help us to be a light to a fallen world in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, thank you, Kathy. First Thessalonians chapter four, uh, I'm going to read verse 13 through 18. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever, so encourage each other with these words. Let's have one more prayer. So Father, a blessing now please on your word. I pray that each heart uh, that receives your word this morning would find good soil there, would find a place for your word. And I pray that you would help us to understand the deep importance of what you are trying to tell us in this word. I pray that it would not be mixed and mingled with a confusion that perhaps we've heard before, but it would be unique and rare and clear, and it will call us to a belief that will help us the rest of our days and on into eternity. We ask for your blessing on your word this morning in Christ's name, amen. So yesterday uh, I went to the mall and Friday and Saturday were the first two times Basically, I've been to the mall in a year and a half, and Friday was to purchase something upstairs, and Saturday was to return it. And uh, so, as I was approaching uh, the escalator yesterday, a really strange thing happened, at least strange to me. Um, as I was pr approaching, I saw a middle-aged woman, uh, probably in her early 40s, with a young daughter, I presume, perhaps about five or at most six years old. And they were just completing the downward uh, scope of the escalator and, and, and me being on the bottom floor, I was about to get on the up. And instead of getting off the escalator and going their way, they got off the escalator and went back up the up again. And so um, I wondered if this was some kind of game or if uh, something was happening that, um, you know, I could explain in my mind what was happening. And as I was midway up the escalator, 
they reached the top and then they went around to the down again. And I realized this was a game that was being played. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I thought about the irony of it for a second. The mall was kind of empty. And, you know, they say malls are going the way of, I don't know, whatever goes away. And uh, so it may not be malls forever. And I thought, how ironic this escalator that was built to travel and transport massive numbers of people was now a, a kind of a play thing. So uh, I couldn't avoid it. As I got to the top and went around the corner and started to walk down, I took a look back. I wanted to see if this was an ongoing thing. And sure enough, there they were back on the way up again. Uh, and so um, I wondered, and I went and returned my item. There was a little problem returning it because uh, there was a delay. And so about 20 minutes later, I came back and I thought to myself, no, <laughs> no, they're not still going to be there. And as I, as I turned the corner where I could see the down escalator, I saw the mom on the escalator. And I thought, oh boy, here we go with all these questions again. And I thought at the bottom, I'm going to find out if the girl's already down the bottom, this is her last trip, or if something else is going on. And as I approached the down escalator, I saw the little girl halfway up the up. So now what had happened is she had left her mom and had gotten proficient at going up and down the escalator. So now she was halfway up while the mom followed way behind on the downside. And the an amazing thing was is as we were passing each other, the little girl and myself, her going up, I'm going down, she looked over with this giant smile and said hi to me as if she were doing something so uh, amazing that I would be very proud of her. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, spoil her time. I said hi with a big smile. And I could see the mom just getting on the up escalator, uh, just not looking so good anymore, just <laughs> looking kind of kind of weary with it. And, um, and I, I thought, uh, you know, and I, I went off. I did not look back again. I mean, this was, yeah, I left the mall and did not look back again. And I thought, you know, um, there, there's a bit of hubris here, and, and it's fun, you know, who would, who would rob a little girl of that, that fun, that pleasure, but, um, but there's hubris of us uh, riding escalators up and down for fun and using them as training toys and, and, and thinking that we've accomplished something by learning how to ride the escalator. Um, but, uh, you know, speaking of hubris, um, this morning, uh, the era of space tourism begins. And I don't know if you've heard it or not, but, but probably even as we speak, uh, Richard Branson is getting on a, uh, a space plane that he built and uh, heading up into uh, space. He's the Virgin Galactic founder and uh, a billionaire to boot. And he's been uh, raising this, um, this capacity to go into space for a number of years. And you might also know that Jeff Bezos, the Amazon owner, uh, is also planning on July 20th to go into space. Uh, he has his own uh, uh, vehicle that he's been working on for since the year 2000 called the Blue Origin. And uh, he plans to go up into space also. And what up into space is, is even in dispute. Uh, there's this USA um, a boundary of 50 miles up, which has been used as the space boundary forever, U.S. space program. But the international uh, boundary is 62 miles. So in the billionaire competition of who gets into space first, they're saying that Branson will probably have an asterisk after his name because he didn't go 62 miles. He only went over 50 miles up. Um, this is uh, quite an example of, of hubris. You might have heard that uh, that the um, th there was a a raffle for an extra ticket on um, the Amazon flight, and it it ended up uh, uh, going for some uh, un incredible amount of of um, uh, twenty something twenty eight million dollars for a place for an extra seat on this rocket, so. So now we've entered the age of space tourism, where you can be a tourist and experience space travel. And, you know, if, if you had any visions of, well, you know, I'd like to do that someday, or 
I remember a science fiction movie where everybody was waiting in the lobby of a, of it looked like an airport, only it was to go into space. They were all following orders. Forget that stuff, okay? This is like buying a ticket, okay? 600 of them have been promised by Virgin Galactic, and they range in 200000 to $250,000 a piece for a ticket. So you're going to have to scrape together a lot of buckos to experience this, and probably for a long time. Uh, Elon Musk, whose who's, uh, SpaceX is the most popular, uh, he, he says that for $55 million, you can get a ticket on his, and you'll be able to orbit. And uh, so, so we've got this, um, uh, you know, we, we've got this um, space tourism beginning. And, and it's totally different from the original space program and the competition to get the nations competing so that we can have the advances in science. And, and I hope you can see the, the difference between those. I, I had an argument late in summer with somebody. It wasn't supposed to be an argument. I didn't want it to be an argument. Uh, I mentioned something just vaguely negative about Elon Musk's, the way he spends his money, and I got a rocket fuel filled response of how I must respect this man for what he's accomplished. And I could see from this person's view of life that the people accomplishing things in this world, regardless of whether it's hubris or not, are the wealthy who are pouring resources into something and who are uh, making, uh, making their way through this giant global economy or whatever, I did not respond and, and uh, the Lord gave me the gracious look and yeah, yeah, I guess you do have to respect that. And we went on talking. Um, but uh, I, I'm reminded of the great, in my mind great, uh, John Polkinghorne, who just passed away a couple months ago at 90 years old. He was a, um, a scientist, uh, a mathematician, until he reached 50, and he said, uh, younger guys need to be doing this. So he went and got ordained after that, became a minister, <laughs> and uh, he started teaching and preaching the scriptures. But he always had this really healthy view of science and faith. He, he never saw them as mutually exclusive. He saw them as integrated together. And he wrote in one of his books, uh, he, he quoted a, um, a, a scientific philosopher uh, in doing this, but he wrote in his book that life needs to be lived uh, with, with not a telescope looking into space. That's the science view of looking into space with a telescope. He said we should look with binoculars. And the binoculars, he said, need to have two perspectives, faith and science. And he had a little phrase which he stole from a philosopher, uh, and, and, it, and it really applies. He said that the world that we live in is filled with clouds and clocks. Clocks are scientifically reducible to microseconds and, and pulses. They're predictable. They're manageable. Uh, they help us in all other uh, forms of our life. But then there's clouds. Clouds don't behave. Clouds don't line up with clockwork. But clouds are just as real as clocks are. And so in, in Polkinghorne's writings, you'll see this, this idea that uh, you, you need to understand that there are clocks and clouds in, in this universe. So I cannot think of a stronger example of us studying this scripture this morning on the morning of space tourism's initial tour, I cannot see a greater example of clocks and clouds than these two things this morning. Because we are going to see in our text this morning that we are destined for clouds. And the clouds we are going to are going to be very real. They are going to be very, uh, very much uh, an episode of faith for us in a very real world, in a very real, real universe. And we're also going to see that there is something critically important that Paul feels that those who believed in Thessalonica, and by extension for us, there's something that we lack if we don't understand what's going to happen. Now, for, for most of us uh, who have been around at all in the environments of Christian teaching, uh, and we at one time or another have realized there's a lot of controversy over how the end times are going to come down. 
Uh, my library is half filled with books. Uh, the End Times Are Here Again uh, being one of them and documenting how many times people thought they were living in the end of time and they really weren't. Uh, the controversies over pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib rapture, even the millennial controversies over are we pre-millennial or post-millennial, uh, those things are all filling library books and conversations and thoughts and conferences. Uh, at least the last time I checked, there were still conferences on that. And um, what I, I understand that what this does to us is it causes us to step back and say, I can't settle this in my mind. I don't know what this is about. This is terribly confusing at times. This requires sometimes as much explanation as a cult does. Uh, so this can't possibly be something that is required of me. And what we do is the proverbial throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We're looking at the bathwater going, this is messy, cloudy, in a bad way cloudy. Uh, this is uh, something I don't really want to know or understand. I never feel good after looking at this and discussing this. I don't want anything to do with this. And what we throw out is the baby. And the baby, according to our text this morning, is something vital for you to understand about life. Now, let me, um, let me begin with verse 13, and let me explain to you what it does say. Uh, it says something uh, very uh, in the negative that's translated into the positive in your New Living Translation. The positive is we want you to know what will happen. The negative, which is stated in the Greek text, is don't be ignorant of this. And the Greek text uses the word ag agno agnosis, <laughs> or uh, what we get our word agnostic from. So you might understand the apostle as literally saying, we don't want you to be agnostic. Now, I want you to think about that this morning. I want you to get the cobwebs out of your brain and, and understand the apostle one of the first followers and, and most dynamic preachers to the Gentiles is telling you Gentiles in Thessalonica and us here this morning, I don't want you to be agnostic. And if you understand anything about philosophy or faith, you would say, I don't want to be agnostic. I have an agnostic neighbor who says, yeah, you just don't know whether there's a God or not. Yeah, you just can't tell. I certainly don't want to say I follow Jesus and be agnostic, do I? Absolutely not. That seems like the absolute end of the road is to say, uh, I'm agnostic. So the importance of this is extremely profound when you think about it in its raw form. Now, um, for those of you who haven't been able to follow us from the start of Thessalonians, we are not using mirror hermeneutics. Mirror her hermeneutics, woo, blah, blah, that came out right. Mirror hermeneutics is as a study of God's Word which says when something is there you're looking at one half of a phone conversation basically in this letter and so you need to figure out what was said or being said on the other side of the conversation and so you get this idea that well something must have provoked Paul to say this and so let's see what it is uh, people were sad people were were hurting and so most of your commentaries on Thessalonians at least are filled with mirror hermeneutics We've discounted that. Please go back and uh, check out our early Thessalonians uh, uh, lessons to understand that that's not what's happening here. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians church just after finding out they still exist, that they are full of faith, that they have not abandoned Jesus, but they're following Jesus. And he is now getting ready to move them forward a little bit. This, there's nothing negative about this. He's not answering an objection. He's not, out. He's not responding to anybody. He's doing his work as an apostle. These people need more faith now because life requires faith upon faith upon faith all the way to the end. So what they're going to have more of and what they, what they need to grow in is this understanding. And Paul does not want them to face life ag agnostically. They are to face life uh, as believers. Okay, a couple years ago, I went to my first military funeral. Now, I've done a lot of funerals where they've had the, uh, you know, the salute, the three-gun uh, salute. I actually did a funeral one time where it was a 21-gun salute. I don't even know 
what that happened. Was that a mistake by the volunteers? I don't know. Uh, some high-ranking person uh, had a funeral, and they, the, you know, they had the honor guard and folded the flag up, and it was really awe-inspiring. But at this military funeral was different. What was different were the, the eulogies and the homilies. It was like looking into a culture uh, where you could see the presence of death was carefully orchestrated in the subculture. That, that this was something, and you would expect that from the military. You would expect they live with the reality of facing death always, and that no one death is going to stop this culture from being able to care for their own, being able to move forward, being able to honor those who have given their life, and, and they expect everyone following to have the attitude of, if this cost me my life, that's okay, because I'm doing this for a greater purpose. And you could see it in every part of everything they mentioned about life. They had a particular nobility about death that was mentioned in the meantime. Uh, I, w I imagine that police work uh, garners the same type of subculture. Uh, perhaps now, uh, you know, firefighting and that type of thing will garner those uh, particular uh, things. And we remember to pray for our uh, uh, firefighters this morning that, uh, you know, uh, there are fires all around California as normal, but the danger is new every day. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that there is preparation for what can probably be expected in these subcultures. And there's not within our Christian uh, world. And let me make that contention to you a little stronger. It's, it's difficult for us to understand the ancient mind of not having ever lived with Christian hope without ever having seen uh, Jesus' uh, hope proclaimed. It's difficult for us to understand the ancient world, the Thessalonian world. They actually had funerary societies, which many people joined up so that you could cope with death of a family member, of a loved one. Uh, they they put on uh, services. They... They had their own way of, of comforting and consolation. They had places for grief that way. And they had explanations for things. Most people in the ancient world belonged to a funerary society. And we know this because there are letters to the emperor telling that they, that they didn't get their money's worth because when their loved one died, they weren't comforted or they weren't taken care of, or they weren't uh, visited by one of these people. And, uh, and, so, and, and we have the response of the emperor, well, get this taken care of right now. And uh, so, um, so it's difficult for us to imagine that world because we've been around so much of Christendom for 2,000 years even of our, of our basic culture. But you know what this has done in our day-to-day -day experience of death? It's turned us into a death-denying culture. We have nefarious understandings about death. We have feelings that are a little bit out of control, a little bit mysterious. Uh, we see a cemetery uh, in town and we're getting a little uncomfortable. Uh, now I grew up across the street from a cemetery, so I learned the wrong things about how to view cemeteries as an adolescent. Um, but you know, in, in a lot of early America, the, the cemetery was the center of town. It was the place where uh, you, you buried those loved ones and you remembered them and you gave pilgrimages to that memory and to those people often. Uh, and those times are, uh, are going away. Um, I guess the best way I can explain this is, is um, reminding you of, of uh, the, the movie The Perfect Storm uh, about a storm storm at sea, the Andrea Gale caught in this terrible storm in 1991, and, and this one ship, all were lost on the ship, and they had this, uh, this, this ceremony, which is in the movie, but it's really happened in, uh, in, in New England, in Gloucester, just outside of Gloucester. Uh, it was actually at St. Anne's Catholic, uh, Catholic Church, but it looked like the Old North Church. If you go on the Freedom Trail, you'll see that that, uh, that church, you can actually sit in the pews and they're marked, you know, Jonathan Edwards sat in this pew or a president, somebody came and sat in this pew to see what American history was all about, you know, quaint uh, gathering of, of historical. And, and so in the perfect storm, they're in this setting, 
where all of the heritage of Puritan America and descending down, but the funeral service and the eulogy is, is gut-wrenching in its absence of hope. It is about the, uh, the terrible state that the Andrea Gale was lost at sea, the fact that they couldn't go and put flowers there, there was no place to, to go, and, and I guess we'll have to remember you crewmen through our, through our dreams and, uh, and through our, 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 our um, uh, sleep. And so that's the way the sermon ends, that tonight uh, sleep well because we're going to dream about you and we're, we're going to uh, sleep for you because you can't sleep. And this vagueness of existence of, of those that were lost, that is the state of what our secular uh, world has and our Christian world has in terms of, of passing away. And we are agnostic in that. Insofar as we look at death as being something vague and something far away, we are agnostic. Paul is trying to change that in, uh, in this passage of Scripture in 50 AD. He doesn't want the Thessalonians to go one day forward without realizing the importance of passing into the presence of the Lord, the magnificent honor of it, and the place that it gives you in the body of Christ when you do that. And so he, he, he goes to verse 14. Now verse 14 um, is stated very directly in the ancient scriptures as a, what's called a, a present general condition. And it's properly translated in your New Living Translation since, given a particular fact. Since this is true, then something else is true. Some of your translations, the New King James, and uh, they'll, they'll say if, if it'll be conditional. This is not conditional. This, is, this statement that Paul is making is, is foundational and it's a consequence. Now, and what's, what is there a consequence of? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's take this apart. Okay, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised again, that's the fact that the way God did this with Jesus is he allowed Jesus to die and then he raised him again three days later. Okay, since that's the way God worked with Jesus, then there's something that you need to understand that until uh, Jesus comes back, you will, you will uh, either go to be with him or you will pass away and and your body, which is just a tent or a shell that you live in, uh, will be in the ground until he comes back. And when he comes back, he'll bring with him the believers who have died. Okay, now don't shy away from this. This is not that difficult to understand. Okay, John chapter 11, Jesus told Mary and the grieving people there that uh, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11, uh, uh, verses 25 onward. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me... Uh, and you live, Zoe, if you have abundant life, if you believe in me and live, you will never die. You will never, ever die. And the meaning of this passage of Scripture is that after the time of Christ's resurrection, to leave this place and this body is to go and be in the presence of the Lord directly. Your body goes in the ground. If you believe in Jesus, you go to be with Christ. And you go to be with him in heaven. There's no break in, in consciousness. Like you don't get in heaven and go, wow, well, I don't wonder how long I've slept. You know, I wonder how long I've missed. You will not miss a, a heartbeat. You will not miss a moment. And, and there's continuity of existence, believing in Christ. That's what he promised. He promised that. He's the giver of life. He's the creator of the universe. And he promised that. And he asked them there that day in John chapter 11 to believe this. Do you believe this? They said yes, but they didn't. And so when the funeral started for Lazarus, uh, they, they were crying and they were weeping. And, and Jesus, uh, I wanted to know uh, where they laid Lazarus. After the scriptures say inside of him, he, got, he started to get angry and he started to get deeply disturbed. He was disturbed because his words were not heeded to. Rather, this reality that they thought was the reality forever of death separating them was going to be the final reality over Jesus' words. 
So the anger inside of him, the, the, uh, the, the dis very disturbed nature of his spirit, because after all, this meant that every single follower, disciple that he had on earth, even Mary, who loved him, now did not believe his words about the resurrection. And so Jesus said, where have you put him? And they told him, and he went. They said, come and see, which, are, which were his words for life. You want to believe in Jesus? Come and see. Follow me. You'll see life. Now they believe in death, so they said, come and see. And the, the anger presided within Jesus over this, but it says in verse 35 of chapter 11 that Jesus wept. He wept for, for a world which could not believe his words, could not receive the hope that he had, could not listen to him and just believe. He had to demonstrate it. And oh, he did demonstrate it. The scriptures tell us at the end of chapter 11 that Jesus went to the tomb. When he got to the tomb, he was still angry, it says in the scripture. And then he called Lazarus forward. He said, Lazarus, come out of there. Came out, displayed his power even over death itself. He displayed his resurrection power. Uh, and his words were true. They were always true. Now they were believed in because now they could see that he actually really did have the power over death. So the consequence that Paul is telling the Thessalonians is because God worked this way, because Jesus died and then a time later he rose from the dead, that's going to happen to you. So you need to understand that there are ramifications to this. Accept this. Understand this about the life you're living and the death you're going to face. Uh, understand this. This is reality and this is critical. So. So we launch into um, this, um, this verse um, 15 through 17, which are, I want to check my time here because I really want you to get this, folks. I want you to get this almost as much as Paul wanted the Thessalonians to get this because people don't get this, and it's not right that they don't get this, okay? So if you can follow that, you're ready for the next stage. So in verse 15 through 17, Paul gives what would look like a military specification in the order of events. It's astounding. It is so clearly spelled out. There is absolutely no ambiguity in it whatsoever. And, and he is telling them God's word regarding this life and the next life and the order of resurrection. This is like the military person being trained in school of, you know, if you should give your life in, in, uh, in service, here's what will happen. The families, here's what will happen. Here's how we take care of those who pass away. Here's your place. Here's your honor. Here's what's at stake here. To fully defining so that you can face life this way. So you can understand this in life without becoming agnostic. So uh, he starts out in, in verse 15. And he says, uh, we being Paul and Silas and Timothy, we tell you this. Uh, it's a word of the Lord. He is, he is claiming that what he is about to say is a word of the Lord. Now, Paul isn't some charismatic crazy, okay? This guy, uh, he was trying to straighten out the people in Corinth who were going uh, uh, bonkers over uh, experiencing the Spirit of God. This is Paul the Apostle who's, who's seen Jesus in heaven, who has specific orders from Jesus to go and reach the Gentiles. This is Paul who has apostolic authority, but also uh, the mission to reach the Gentiles for Christ. And he says, I'm going to share with you a word from the Lord. This isn't for your edification. This isn't for your uh, comfort from an overwhelming grief. And there's a mistranslation in your text that might lead you to that. This is to call you to live a life understanding this. That's what the words are. We are called to live this way. And so uh, he starts out and he, and he says that uh, we tell you this word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord is that, and it's, it, it starts out with a subject of the first phrase, and there are threefold subjects referring to one group of people. Those of us who are alive, Zoe, those of us who have a, had abundant life through Christ, it is we, Paul includes himself and Silas and Timothy, along with all of the Thessalonican believers, we, those of us who are alive, and those who are left remaining. 
Notice I didn't say left behind. I said left <laughs> remaining. Those who are left remaining uh, until the coming of the Lord. So you are going to start out, if you believe in Jesus from day one, you are left remaining until the coming of the Lord. All of you here this morning are left uh, remaining before the coming of the Lord. Now, if one of us goes to be in the presence of the Lord, we are, we are no longer in that category anymore, and we are in a better category. That's kind of the whole point of this. We're in the presence of the Lord. And instead of, instead of looking at this like, oh, I need to cling to life uh, until the Lord comes back, because if I don't, all is lost, uh, you need to understand something. There's a higher honor for someone who lives a life and completes it and goes on to be with the Lord. Paul wants this known from day one in Christianity and in the faith in Thessalonica. He doesn't want people going, well, I guess I better get one of those funerary societies because I don't know what I'm going to do if, if, if my parents pass away. Or I don't know what I'm going to do if, if this doesn't work out for us and, and maybe they'll help. He doesn't want that to even enter anybody's mind. He wants them to understand something that this God who created and gave us eternal life inside, this God has taken care of us. This is the word he sent to us, this clear order of events uh, that, that's going to happen. So, group of people, all of us, and then he says, uh, will, uh, will not arrive at, will not come before, will not precede, or all your translations. It's, it's stated in a very strong way um, that uh, thano is the Greek word, but we will not precede makes you think, well, that means we're not going to go before, cut in line. But, but the actual verb means arrive at. You're going to arrive at nothing ahead of uh, those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. Okay, That's the basic word of the Lord, which is now going to get an explanation in detail. So get that straight. We who remain here, those who are alive uh, on, on earth, are not going to arrive at the destination that we are headed toward, which is salvation. We are not going to arrive there ahead of those who have fallen asleep or died in the Lord. Okay. So that's, that's clear. That's the basic statement that's, that's being made here. Now, when he says you will not uh, arrive at, you will not come before, he uses a double negative, a really strong double negative. You will certainly not. You will not in your wildest imagination arrive before those who have given their life already, who have lived and died for Jesus, you will not precede them. You will not arrive at Don't even think it, is what Paul is saying in the strongest words. Now he gives a lengthy order of things that are going to happen. And the first thing that's going to happen, he says, is that the Lord will come down with a command, will come down, I'm sorry, from heaven. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. This is the same passage, uh, same word used in uh, uh, Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 8, when Jesus came down from the mountain. He, he came down, only he's coming down from heaven. Now remember your structure of Thessalonians, where the third of, of the four things that Thessalonians is about is we wait for the return of Jesus from heaven. Remember I kept telling you that from heaven is really important. We're not looking for another person to rise up out of the sea of humanity and become a great leader and to lead us all to glory land. We're not looking for that. Better. We're looking for someone who's in heaven to come back because that's better than someone rising up and having to go through the ropes of, of achieving the salvation. So, so part of uh, Thessalonians is about waiting. How do we wait for Jesus from heaven. What does that mean to wait for him? And part of what it means is to not look to anybody else or to look at anybody else in order to, to have this salvation that he's promised. So the Lord comes down from heaven. That's step one. That's mill spec number one. The Lord comes down from heaven. So it's, it says uh, then in that uh, coming down from heaven that it will be at the shout of a command. His command, probably, John chapter 5, verse 28, Jesus said, 
There's a day coming where the dead uh, in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forward to a resurrection. They're going to hear Jesus say, come out, come down. Not just Lazarus, come out of that grave, but all of humanity will hear the call to come out. And it will be the command of Jesus himself. So he shouts, and then there's a voice of the archangel. So there's a hierarchy to the universe. Folks, I'm sorry that it gets complicated, but God has his universe under control, despite what it looks like in Southern California or other parts uh, in the Western Hemisphere. It is under control. God has powers and principalities. He has a structured layer of existence to make sure that his will is carried out all the way down the line. Uh, when the books in Revelation are, are opened uh, so that the, uh, the seventh seal is broken, there's silence in heaven for a half an hour because they're studying the commands of God. All of the hierarchy of authority are studying what they're to do next when, that, when that's revealed. It takes a half an hour of our time. And eternally, that's a long time for those archangels and beings to understand what they're supposed to do next. God bless you. But they are under control and under command. Revelation 12, 7. Michael is the only named archangel that we see in Scripture. But there's an indication that there are others who are responsible for other groups of angels. They are commanders of angels. Uh, if, you know, in our interest... Uh, peaks at that point and we want to know more about it because we're interested in power structures for some some reason though we know the most powerful being who ever existed god and and father son and spirit we still want to know about all the other powers for some reason but we don't need to at this point and then thirdly the trumpet uh it's interesting uh the trumpet of god it's interesting that in matthew 24 when jesus is going through this same scenario from a different perspective and in verse 30 of Matthew 24, he says that God will appear, Jesus will appear in the sky, and it says there that the whole earth will mourn. That's an intriguing thing. You would think, you know, that Jesus would appear in the sky, there'd be some sign that the Lord is coming back. You would expect some emotion. Uh, you know, it tells us that some people will hide in the rocks and want the rocks to fall on them. Uh, you know, that because they obeyed, disobeyed Christ and they've, they've realized they were against God. But, but the idea that they'll all, they'll all mourn, that's strange to me. And that deserves our thinking about in this context. That Jesus doesn't want this, this mourning, this sorrowful, uh, you know, the end of this existence. And, oh, I don't know what the next one's going to be like, but I sure loved it here. And... I liked riding that escalator. I liked Magic Mountain. I liked Disneyland. I just love those things, and I want more of them. I don't know. I'm making fun and hyperbole, but you get the whole point. So they mourn, uh, and, and then it says that the Lord will command his angels to go and gather all the chosen ones around the earth, be gathering. That's the same thing we're seeing here, that, that angelic beings will participate in the gathering and the carrying out of the return of Christ. And so uh, Jesus comes down from heaven, step one. Step two, the dead will rise up first. The word first, proton, is emphasized. The dead will rise first. What does this mean? This means that those who are in their graves, their bodies will be reassembled and brought forth. Now, before you accuse me of absurdity, uh, I will I will tell you that God who made all of this creation is able to reassemble uh, the bodies of everyone who ever lived and then transform them from corruptible, decaying bodies into incorruptible, glorious bodies. You are not made to live outside of a body. And you might think, oh, bummer, I was hoping to be a God on a planet somewhere and control universes or whatever. But really, it's a good thing. It's a good thing because we're finite, and we need that feeling of finiteness. Uh, if a lot more dependent on us than does depend on us, we'd probably be out of sorts all the time, okay? So, um, so you are meant to have a body. And in living in a body now, there's only a temporary state where you, you're in the presence of the Lord until he comes back and gives you a new body. And the way he's gonna do that is, he's gonna bring you back if you've gone to be with him, you are coming back, as it says here in verse 15, you're coming back with him. 
He will create a new body out of the residue of your old body. And I don't know whether he has to do special commands to gather molecules and atoms around the world, or he just takes whatever rib is left in your coffin, or whatever ashes are left in the urn. I don't know how he does that. Uh, it's his business. Uh, but he will reassemble you and then transform your body into a glorious state. You will be you will be without aging process, you will be without defect, you will be perfect in every way, the same that Jesus was perfect after the resurrection. It's the way he did it with Jesus, he's, it's the way he'll do it with you. And this is intriguing. If this doesn't spark your imagination, yeah, your imagination needs some embers to go, you need some bellows to pump it. This is, what we're, this is how we're supposed to be living our lives, understanding this is what's going to happen. And then one day when it starts to happen, it will happen boom, boom, boom so fast. You will not even get to grab your Bible and go, what did it say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Oh my gosh, I forgot what it said. Okay, you're going to have to be living this. Now in the world in which Paul wrote, there was trouble coming. Philippi was already a place where you could get beaten within an inch of your life and even killed for believing in Jesus. You could face execution for saying you followed Christ. So preparing people for the next life was a vital part of the community of Christian faith, which would go 300 years and 10 persecutions until the time where it was normalized in the empire. And so this, is, this was vitally important in Thessalonica, but this is important for you also, because without this, you're going to be on that escalator going around and around going, I want to go up again. I want to go up again. I like the feeling. Or maybe you'll spend your whole life scraping and, and, and working to the point where you're finally a billionaire and you're going to say, I want to go up into space. And it'll be an eight minute ride. You'll go 50 miles high and you'll come back down, maybe. Okay? So the, the whole idea here is this is our hope. This is how you're supposed to live because this is the reality. These are the clouds of our existence that are just as real as the clocks around us. This is how we are supposed to conduct our thoughts about living this life and about passing away and about going on to the next life. So those, those who have died and gone to be with the Lord, they will be raised first, foremost, proton. And then down the list, uh, then he goes back to the three designations of himself and the Thessalonians. Uh, those who who are alive now, who have Zoe in them now. Uh, we, he says, those who are left remaining, this group of people then will be snatched away. Harpazo is the Greek word. It's the word that the Plymouth Brethren used for rapture, but this is the only place in Scripture where it's used in context. And this harpazo means that those who are alive on the earth at the time are going to follow those who have been raised from, from death and into life, they're going to follow them and they're going to, it says literally, be called to a meeting in the sky. Called to a meeting in the sky. I want to be at that meeting. And when I see that first sign of the Lord's return, I want my heart to go, there's a meeting is going to happen and it's going to be for all of us together in the air. We're going to meet with Him in the air. We're going to meet with Him. Literally, it says... Uh, in, in the air, era, in the, in the Greek, in the sky, the same air that the, that the tourism of space is going to today. You're getting a free ride, except it's not free. Jesus paid for it. But it's just as real as the billions that have been paid to go up today. The, the meeting with the Lord. And then he says that we will always be with the Lord after that moment. Now, this is another add-on to what we've been learning in Thessalonians. Remember, we've seen the last day, the last gathering, the parousia, the parousia, depends on how you want to pronounce it. Remember, in the presence of the Lord. This is just before then. So, he does all the work of final salvation and redemption and glorification, and then we return down to stand before the Lord. And the Thessalonians are going to be there, and Paul's going to be happy. And remember, he added on that we're going to be standing in the presence of the Father, who he prays to. And we're going to be standing there as followers of Jesus, faithful followers of Jesus, in a glorified, non-dying body, uh, paid for by Jesus himself and his death on the cross. 
So this is, the, this is what Paul and Jesus want you and I to understand two millennial after uh, this was originally written. This was a word from the Lord to the believers. This is what's going to happen to you. This is your destiny. This is your fate. And when someone goes home to be with the Lord, you need to understand something. They've just taken a step forward that you may or may not be able to take one day, but that you are to understand that they are going forward and you are still remaining here. And you're not to look at that like, well, I wish I was still alive here. Uh, you're not to look at it like that because the understanding that to be, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord is a part of a glorious hope that God can only tell us and reveal to us here uh, spiritually. So what's, what's left in this passage? Well, what's left in this passage is, is that um, uh, in verse uh, 18, we're told, in your translation, it says comfort each other, but it doesn't really have the word comfort. It has the word parakaleo. It means to call. Call each other to these words. And I'm calling you this morning to have a, an outlook on life and death that is such that you understand, like the military person who goes out to the battle, he understands he's to focus on the battle. He's not to worry about life and death. He's, he's cared for by others. He's, he's taken care of in that way, and he's only asked to sacrifice his life if absolutely necessary. But if he is, he's going to do it anyway, because that's the calling. And so... I want you to understand something, that we're called to live our life as if death is, is more insignificant than it's ever been. Death is the passing from this life to the next. Some of us, uh, most of us will, and some of us will still be remaining here when the Lord comes back. But, but together, we're all going to be with the Lord in the air, and then He's going to come down and we're going to have this time together beyond which we cannot see, beyond which we're not told. We're only given glimpses of the wedding feast of the Lamb and the final ushering into the kingdom of God. But life itself, uh, beyond that point, we don't understand it. But up to that point, it's a life full of faith, full of hope, full of desire, a healthy look at those, a healthy view of those who are going on before us, a healthy understanding that they are to have uh, honor and a place in our heart, not just in our memory, not just in our, in our dreams. You, you know, in ancient society, these funerary societies that I was telling of, you about, when a person died, they would finally give them a place. They would define them. They would look at their life. They would say, oh, this, this is what this person was about. And then in this funerary society, they would always know that person that way. So their life was not predefined. It was defined after they died. God wants us to view each other as a work in progress. We are coming to faith in Christ, full faith. He is rescuing us from the wrath to come. He is currently in a rescue operation, calling us to more and more faith. And when our faith is at the point where he calls us home, uh, we're to go home. And at that point, we have a place in Christ that's indisputable. It's undeniable. It's definable in every way, and it is secure and eternal. And so we can live our lives trying to have more faith and trying to please God with faith, understanding that we're getting closer and closer to the salvation by doing so. So let me, tell you, let me um, propose this to you. If you were going up into space tourism, let's say in a year from now, it would make your life uh, have some needs, right? You'd need to know, uh, hey, what do I need to do? How do I need to prepare for myself? How do I, what do I need to bring? Do I bring my razor for eight minute flight? Uh, wh where do I go to get on the flight? There'd be very specific things you need to know. And you wouldn't have to understand space travel. You wouldn't have to understand how the rockets work. Uh, they might not tell you that, uh, you know, when you hit the ground, you're going to be at 20 miles an hour, so you better be ready for a little collision there. They might tell you that. But you don't really have to know uh, everything about space travel, though you might want to. So uh, all this is to say that you are living in a reality where you're going to do this travel if you believe in Jesus. So you need to know some specific things. 
And that's exactly what Paul has told us. You need to know that at a certain moment, Jesus is coming back from heaven with a shout. And that during that shout, there'll be the voice of an archangel. It's all over. And then there'll be a trumpet sound of God, a call to gathering. There will be angelic beings rushing around every corner of the earth to gather the chosen ones. That'll be you. You'll probably pick you up by your collar if it's me uh, and, and take us off to this, this meeting. And that secondarily, the dead in Christ will rise first. And I don't want you to see those being reassembled in Christ and go, wow, that's weird. What is that? That's scary. I want you to look at that and go, yeah, mom, yeah, dad, yeah, Billy, yeah, cool, great. I want you to have the joy of the Lord and then understand in a few moments, you're going to be picked up and transformed and you're going to meet them in the air together. Your hopes will rise and build and be consummated in eternal life and we will be with the Lord forever. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, please help us to get within our hearts and minds the reality of your second coming and your final salvation. I pray that we could have a view toward life and death that's not only healthy, but victorious. And I pray that it would please you ultimately, Lord, because that's what you're calling us to, is, is to be pleasing to you. And, and unless we call each other to be, to be strong, to be faithful... Uh, to not just live to survive, but to live to thrive in Christ. Unless we understand that calling to each other, we're just going to be stuck in, a, in an endless loop. But with your word, with your hope, we're going to go forward and we're going to live this life for its fullness in the faith. And we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. All right, may God bless you now. I pray that his spirit would be on you and in you. I pray that you would understand the stakes and the um, uh, trouble that God has gone through for all of us so that we can live our life free from the fear of death which is all around us everywhere worse than a barking dog and yet we can live our lives free from it knowing that Christ will come again and get us and take us to where he is forevermore. May you know this this week and experience the blessings and benefits of it in Christ's name. Amen.